Barbara Eifler, Chief Executive of Making Music. Thank you so much for joining me. Your organisation represents 3,700 groups of singers and instrumentalists up and down the UK. And you are the best possible person to talk to, to try to help us understand what the new guidance from the government and the recent research from Declan Costello, which was published just yesterday, what that means for choirs and other instrumental groups, etc., up and down the country. So the burning question everybody wants to know is, can my choir get back to singing? Um, well, the short answer is yes, it can. Um, so, uh, as you've just said, the guidance was updated on the 13th of August. And uh, even then, uh, you know, it was made clear in the introduction that, you know, previously um, there were uh, extended measures required and that um, singing wind and brass were not recommended at all for, I mean, they weren't allowed for non-professionals. Um, so that changed on the 13th of August, and uh, it does now say that um, following the research that they commissioned, both professionals and non-professionals can now engage in singing wind and brass in line with this guidance, but that people should continue to socially distance from those they do not live with wherever possible. So the big distinction that we can still see to the professionals is that um, there, there's clear guidance in here that says as a non-professional, you should never compromise the two meter social distancing. As a professional, you can, you know, if you're presenting an opera or something that requires that performers come closer together. Um, but for non-professionals, that is not to be uh, compromised. So, the question, though, that arose in everybody's mind was, um, uh, what are the numbers? In what numbers can we get together? And um, there was a comment, uh, well, there, 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 there was a bit in the guidance that said, non-professionals are restricted by rules on meeting people outside their home. Yes, indeed. So everybody um, assumed that that meant uh, meeting people socially outside your home, which at the moment in England, and let's make it clear here that we're talking about England only at the moment. Uh, I can say something about the other nations in a minute if you want. Yes, please. Um, so in England at the moment, you can meet uh, you know, people from six other uh, or six, people from six different households can meet um, outside their home, uh, inside their home, uh, two different households. So people assume that that would mean the same for their group. And of course, that means very small sectionals, um, you know, uh, for choirs or instrumental groups. Um, but I think the, the crucial thing there was, you know, social interaction should be limited to that. So we had uh, gone back to DCMS to ask for clarification whether that meant also musical activity was to be restricted to that. Um, and now they have clarified that uh, planned activity needs to be aligned with the guidance under the subheading on gatherings in COVID-19 secure venues. So they have clarified in the uh, guidance about meeting people from outside your household, we all tend to read just the first bit that see it says only meet five other people. Whereas actually it goes on on the various headings to tell you about um, you know, gatherings in COVID-19 secure venues. And then there's another uh, paragraph, gathering in larger groups. And so they are in that guidance that we are being pointed to. So, so this is huge. So you are saying then that if you have a choir of, I don't know, 80 or 100 people or more, provided you can maintain the two metre social distancing rule, everybody in your choir can come back into the space and sing together. Correct. Now, the social distancing, and that's not just during the musical activity, that is at entry, at exit, during breaks, on the way to the loo, queuing for the toilet, you know what I mean, all that, at all times. So that is still going to be very very difficult for most people unless they rehearse in a football stadium um but there is a specific paragraph now that they've inserted which says within this guidance there are no set limits on the numbers who can be involved in planned non-professional activity taking place outside and or in a covid secure venue wow 
Okay, now if you are the chair person or the, you know, the, the person who organizes your choir, you're going to be taking very, very close, uh, paying close attention to what you've just said about the numbers, etc. You're probably going to have to do a risk assessment, aren't you, for your venue where you rehearse. What is that going to involve for most people? Well, um, it's going to involve quite a lot of work. And I'm just working on a giant template to help people do that, which is taking me a little bit longer um, than I thought it would, because there is so much detail to go through. Um, OK, so I would think the the first thing you need to think about is who is responsible for this activity. So generally, there's a committee, which might also be charity trustees all need to be involved in this because it's a collective responsibility as the people who run the organization even if they're not individually all the ones doing the actions the the second thing is that you need to look up what you can do in your nation or your area because there will still be local restrictions local lockdowns um and there there's a you know uh websites out there where you can look all that up the nhs and government have websites so that's the other thing you need to factor in but the then the third thing you really need to talk to is your stakeholders and by that i mean your participants um health and safety law is quite clear that you need to consult with your workers um and that applies to volunteer participants as well um you know as you create your risk assessment and um and decide on what mitigating mitigating measures to take so the very first thing we would recommend is that you um survey your members you know either electronically or the ones that you can't reach you phone them up really try and get an answer from all of your members about whether they want to and under what circumstances they want to come back to meeting in person we think it's unlikely that it will be a hundred percent at the moment um, so that might help you a little bit with your venue considerations um, you also must uh, find out in that process who is uh, considered um, at high risk uh, or moderate risk uh, on the NHS definition um, so how vulnerable people are um, and then that helps you decide whether you want to have a policy of excluding those people for now or um you know how you're going to make it possible for people who are vulnerable to to attend rehearsals if you want them to the other stakeholders obviously are um the musical directors um because you know they may themselves be vulnerable um, or they may work in the rest of their professional lives in environments where they don't want to risk importing COVID. You know, I don't know whether you teach in a school or whatever. Um, so, so they may not be able to, to lead in-person rehearsals for that reason. Um, so therefore, that is a discussion that you need to have very early on uh, uh, to find out what that situation is and what else you could do. I mean, maybe, you know, if you were that MD, you would happily carry on leading online activities for those who can't attend, but share, uh, share the job, so to speak, with someone who can be there in person. You know, maybe you have an assistant MD, I don't know, you know, some yeah. people do. So, so it's just something to think about. Obviously, the other major stakeholder is your venue, your rehearsal venue, and you must go and talk to them. Um, the main thing here is well are they even open um are they uh looking forward to having you back what is their risk assessment what measures have they put in place because you're going to have to work hand in glove with those arrangements um they will be just like you very nervous initially about reopening about welcoming you back um so so the better your risk assessment and the more you think about it, the more you will reassure them as well as your own members uh, that, that the activity will be um, secure. Um, so, so yes, I mean, working with a venue and to their specifications obviously is a big thing. It is probably going to be difficult to accommodate your whole choir in, uh, in the venue that you used to have, um, but, 
as I say, this might be put off for a little bit of time if initially you only have 50% of the choir who are willing to come back. That buys you three or four months thinking time and investigation about where else you could go. Yes. Um, I mean, the other thing to say is that outside at the moment is still an option, you know, and possibly depending on where you are in the UK for, for some of September and October. Um, so consider that as well, because that, you know, is acceptable. So let's talk a little bit about um, insurance and risk, because this will be uppermost in the minds of many people, I think, at this point in the conversation. What happens, heaven forbid, if there's an outbreak? Is anybody legally responsible? Would it be the venue? Would it be the committee of the organisation? What do they need to do in that regard? So, so the organisation is obliged to do a risk assessment and it is obliged to introduce as many measures. I'm just looking for the quote. Here we go. Organisations have a duty to reduce risk to the lowest reasonably practicable practicable level by taking preventative measures okay so if you can show that you have looked at the risks you have put in place as many mitigating measures as possible and it says in this document um, as well this is a cumulative thing you know it's not either face coverings or this it's like doing as much as you possibly can um, then you have done what you can to to mitigate the risk and therefore if someone falls ill you will not be held liable um, you would only be held liable if you were proven to have acted negligently and you know if you have all this stuff in place then you won't have been negligent but the other thing to say is we are all individually responsible this is a hobby this is a leisure time activity right if you don't feel safe or comfortable going, don't go. You should not. Um, and also, we all need to act responsibly in not going if we have any symptoms, if we live or have been in close contact with anybody with symptoms, if we've been abroad um, and have been asked to self-isolate, etc. So individuals have got responsibilities. Now, in the case of a lot of choirs that are leisure time for their members, they might employ professionals in the MD, the pianist, that sort of thing. What's the responsibility of the choir organisers to the professionals that they employ on a weekly basis? Very much the same, right? They, they need to reduce the risks. And this is why I say, you know, you need to have a conversation because obviously many of you MDs have got a portfolio career of, you know, uh, 14 different things that you do in any given week. Um, and, uh, and the groups need to make sure that you are comfortable uh, and able to come back. I mean, um, in my main band uh, that I play, you know, the conductor is in an age group that would be considered vulnerable, you know, so uh, he may not want to come back. Um, but that's his choice. He, there are no stipulations that he mustn't come back. It's up to him. No, exactly. So, um, but he would have to take responsibility for that. You know, the group might point out to them that they are vulnerable and do they really want to come back um, but if they choose to they need to realize that that is at their own risk okay so the organizations the can't can't make you come back and lead rehearsals in person if you don't feel comfortable doing that right understood going back to the venues briefly can we talk about ventilation because this came up a lot in the research and etc. What are the requirements when it comes to ventilating your venue? Well, I think um, there, there isn't really that much clear. Well, not in this country. So the Americans have done a little bit more in the preliminary findings that they've released in their study. And um, there are some German uh, studies about it. But basically, if you have a mechanically ventilated venue, that is usually good news. Um, unfortunately, I know that that is not going to be applicable to most of the ancient churches that people rehearse in. And that um, means air conditioning, doesn't it? Yes. 
Um, and But also certain types, you know, you should look at how old is the system, how well has it been maintained, has it got filters fitted, um, you know, does it draw the air upwards, so away from people, you know, if it draws it across people, then that will be like, oh, great, I'm just pulling in the, the virus aerosol from my neighbour. Um, you know, the same reason why you should not have fans, okay, whatever you do, don't have fans, because if you imagine, it's like, you know, stirring the soup, really, um, you're just recycling air. Yeah, so air conditioning systems should not be ones that reuse air, they should be ones that use clean air. Um, so, so those are some of the things, and there, I mean, the Germans go a little bit further saying, I don't know, it should be six uh, um, air exchanges per hour is the sort of gold standard, I think. So yeah. you can see that that is quite a high requirement for most of the places that I know our members rehearse in, um, uh, which aren't necessarily modern buildings fitted with that kind of equipment. Yeah. So can I ask you about volume? Because this is another big issue that the press have certainly picked up on over the last 24 hours since Declan's research was released, that volume is the big um, change maker when it comes to the amount of aerosol created. Does this mean that all choirs should be trying to sing quietly all the time? Well, maybe not all the time, but I think that is something that uh, you could factor in. I mean, as an MD, um, you know, just having people in one room again is going to be a novelty and, and probably quite exciting. As it is, the sound will be different to what it was before because, you know, you're going to have people spread behind pillars and, and you know, at two metres distance. Um, so, yes, I think you should consider volume. Um, I mean, it, the Australian webinar that I watched, they were even going as far as kind of going, mm, shall we do all the repertoire by humming this? this autumn you know so um so that you don't use the consonants that also kind of spit out more aerosol right uh, and also obviously if you're asking people to sing loudly they will also breathe in more deeply and that's the part of the equation that nobody has measured yet is actually not how much do you chuck out but how much do you need to breathe in how, how long does this cloud of aerosols linger in your rehearsal room and uh, how much of it, you know, uh, stays infectious for how long? So if you're asking people to sing more quietly, they're not going to, you know, do that big breath. Um, so and what about face coverings? Should people be singing with a mask on? I would suggest yes. And they're suggesting that in a number of places, like in Germany, in Berlin, I think they've just brought out new um, guidelines for choirs. Um, so the thing to bear in mind is I've been asked about visors as well versus face coverings. So visors, apparently, um, you know, they might stop the aerosols initially blowing, you know, uh, upwards. But actually, um, firstly, they will still escape down the bottom and also they can act as sort of uh, virus traps you know so so actually much more effective are the face coverings because they generally just dampen you know what you're chucking out is that are you able to say is that a requirement of the guidance that you must wear a face mask in your choir rehearsal or is that advised or is it optional well it's not it's not said in the guidance that you must do this but in our risk assessment we suggest very strongly that you should ask people to wear face coverings at all times now the thing for singers to bear in mind is that once they're wet through um they are no longer effective so you, you know singers should bring two or three to rehearsals um and then that means thinking about you know putting the wet one in a sealed plastic bag uh, etc um but yeah, I mean, obviously, it's a slightly, you, you can't blow the trumpet whilst wearing a face covering, but you can wear it all the rest of the time because remember the actual danger points to some extent is not when everybody's sitting quietly on their chair doing the music. It's, you know, when they're all arriving in a bunch or leaving or trying to get out the room to go, you know, to the toilet. So, so that's when everybody should make sure they still social distance and, and wear face coverings. Right. And everybody will have seen over the last couple of days on the news, the experiments Declan Costello and his team were doing with, with people singing. 
But what you're saying at the moment and the guidance that's come out is not just for choirs, is it? No. So brass and wind are also uh, able to, to resume activity, which is great. Uh, I mean, really, um, they were found not to chuck out as many aerosols as people had uh, originally thought. And that kind of makes sense. If you have, uh, I don't know, three and a half meters of tubing on a tuba, I mean, is there anything going to come out at the end? Um, quite often, not even a sound. So, um, you know, it's a, 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 there's a long way to travel. But obviously, you've got different problems. Like you have the instruments that accumulate spit, and you need to dispose of that safely. Can you say what that would be for, for a brass player? So, well, so for the aerosols, one of the things that um, could be considered uh, is a sort of what I call a, a shower cap for trumpets. Do you know what I mean? You can imagine what I'm talking about. Um, but in terms of spit disposal, it's just like it mustn't go on the floor. People need to bring towels, they need to bring, you know, uh, containers to dispose of it. Um, and that then, uh, again, that needs to be disposed of in a safe way. So rubbish is a consideration and cleaning, obviously, in venues. Um, okay. So just to be clear also, Declan focused very much on aerosols, which is now the thing that people are more concerned about than droplets. But droplets are the other transmission route. So, um, you know, you, you, you also kind of spit out uh, uh, droplets when you speak or sing, which are heavier than air and fall on surfaces, or you might have them on your hands and then you go and pick up the coffee mug, et cetera. So they are passed on through shared surfaces. And that's why, you know, hand washing and cleaning, et cetera, are still very much things that people need to think about as well. Right. And this guidance and what you're saying now, this is applicable immediately, is it? Choirs can get yeah. back together straight away. Yes. Right. Now, if you're the music director of a choir or a band, you're going to be thinking about your first rehearsal, but you need to sing or play something. So you're going to be thinking about your concert. What do you think, what's the situation for concerts that people might be planning towards the end of the year around Christmas? Well, it, uh, it seems to me that they are actually, I haven't been through it for the concerts because we were mostly concerned first about getting people back to rehearsal. Yeah. But it does seem to me that it also uh, opens the door to performances with the restrictions that are in place at the moment. So outdoors, great. I'm hoping my brass band will be on a bandstand very soon, um, but definitely by Christmas to play carols. Um, but for indoors, you are going to struggle with capacity and social distancing and those kind of issues more than anything else. You know, if you're singing uh, at the beginning of a football match in the middle of a stadium, yeah, I think you're probably going to be all right. But, um, you know, a choir of 200 in a church with 400 audience, you need to look at that because audiences need to be socially distanced. So you've got a great limit on capacity. You're going to manage those numbers. It's, it's going to be hard. But I think rehearsals first. Rehearsals first. So let me ask you then, Barbara, about how this applies to the other nations, not just England. Okay, so um, obviously the other nations have responsibility for the guidance in their area. Um, quite often they will use elements or the same guidance as was uh, um, issued by the UK government. Now, Northern Ireland uh, published guidance uh, two weeks ago, and it is the, the guidance that predates the update that we've had from DCMS. So actually, where previously, choirs and wind and brass could get together, they now can't. They are now being stopped. So um, uh, we're looking to see what can be done there. Now, Scotland and Wales have delayed and delayed publishing their guidance. It was supposed to come out uh, at the very end of July. Um, and we are now told that Scotland should be next week and Wales at the end of the first week of September. So we are hoping that they will take note of the changes that have happened in England and uh, therefore not disadvantage, you know, non-professionals. Right. Okay. So a little bit more waiting time in the other nations at the moment. Yeah. 
Brilliant. So can you tell me, are there any resources on the Making Music website that people can go to if they want clarification on any of the things we've spoken about? Uh, yes, so we have a tool that we've developed, um, which is on our website, it's available to everybody where you can click which nation you're in, whether you're a performing group or a promoting group, and therefore you can then look up what is permitted in terms of uh, rehearsals or public performances. So uh, please do go and have a look because uh, otherwise you'll have to listen to me for a very long time. Barbara Eiffel, Chief Executive of Making Music, thank you very much indeed. Thank you.